just make an intersex and we'll write there. Okay. Yeah, thanks. My name is Betsy Driver. I'm a person who was born with intersex. And I am also the executive director and co-founder of an intersex peer support organization called Bodies Like Ours. Perfect. Great. Betsy, can you um, explain for people the term intersex, exactly what it is? Intersex, very briefly and very simply, is just a variation of chromosome or genital differences that don't match what society and medicine call standard male and female. There was... What are some other terms that they people could compare it to or they used to refer to intersex as? Previously, intersex was referred to as hermaphroditism. To a certain extent, it still is by some. And over the course of time, there's been different words that have been popular, such as pseudohermaphroditism or female pseudohermaphroditism or male pseudohermaphroditism. And then, of course, you get into all the different intersex t conditions, the different types of intersex conditions, which, of course, then gets into a whole bunch of different words. Right now, the current term, the common term used medically and by much of society, and especially by intersex advocates, is intersex. And intersex itself is a medical umbrella term. There's not any simple, single, there's, there's no single medical diagnosis of intersex. Intersex being the medical umbrella term actually covers several dozen different types of intersex conditions. And, and, and intersex, the, and the, the word came about probably because it, it means the combination of, of two sexes, correct? Presumably. 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 I've never really done the word. I have That's done word. Yeah, I've done word history on it. Mm -hmm. um, it originally was used in the late 1800s to refer to bisexual people. Then it moved into referring to people who had gender identity issues. And finally, in about probably the 1960s and 1970s, it began to be used for people born with what was commonly called before then hermaphroditism. So in, in sort of a pol politically correct times, for people to understand, they can sort of understand it through the usage of the word hermaphrodite, but the word hermaphrodite is really not politically appropriate to use, correct? Well, the problem with the word hermaphrodite is people think about hermaphrodites from Greek mythology, and they think that it means people are born with two full sets of genitals, and that can't happen. That's biologically impossible. There is absolutely no human being running around on Earth that has a full set of female reproductive organs and female genitals, as well as male reproductive organs and male genitals. So. In that sense, it's incorrect. You know, human beings cannot reproduce with themselves. Snails can. Snails are actually hermaphrodites. Um, sponges are hermaphrodites. So, you know, if you think about it, SpongeBob SquarePants is a hermaphrodite, <laughs> as is Nemo. Um, and the clownfish are hermaphrodites. They can reproduce with themselves, or they can, you know, either produce eggs or produce sperm, you know, fertilize or lay the eggs. With human beings, it comes out where our genitals and our reproductive structure basically comes from the same biological tissue. You know, a clitoris is nothing more than a small penis, or vice versa. You could say a penis is nothing more than a big, giant clitoris. Mm -hmm. The ovaries and the testicles come from the same tissue. Um, the labia and the scrotum come from the same tissue. So in that sense, it tends to be a variation. The other issue with hermaphrodite is it's also, it's quaint and it's Victorian. And it just doesn't really represent very well. You know, there's so many different types of intersex conditions where you might have somebody who, you know, is absolutely female. They have an o uterus and ovaries, but they have an enlarged clitoris. So when they're born, they may not look female. Or they may look ambiguous. They don't know, male or female. Or you may have somebody who's born with a type of intersex condition where their chromosomes don't match what the genitals look like. So can you tell us your story, your personal story? I was born in the mid-1960s. When I was born, they couldn't tell if I was a boy or girl at first. It took a couple of days and extensive medical testing. The reason that happened is I was born with something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a form of intersex. It's going to interrupt you. The most common form of intersex, correct? It depending upon. It's the most common form of intersex that leads to 
surgery. It's not necessarily the most common form of intersex because, but that also gets into how you define intersex. You know, the definition of intersex, particularly medically, is hotly contested and in dispute. You know, what conditions, you know, are an intersex condition, which ones are not. And, of course, you know, both medically, socially, and within the intersex movement, you know, there's some political ramifications as to what actually defines an intersex condition. In my own situation with the CAH, I was born with an enlarged clitoris. It was, uh, it was quite enlarged, actually. It was about three centimeters long at birth. They, like I said, they didn't know if I was a boy or a girl. Once they determined that I was a girl because I had a uterus and ovaries, I was then scheduled for what they call feminizing surgery. And at the age of three months, I underwent a full clitor clitorectomy. In my medical records, it says that the clitoris was amputated to the nub. And when I was a young teenager, just before puberty then, they also constructed the vagina. And when I was born, even though I had a uterus and ovaries, there was um, not really a visible vaginal opening. You know, I did have the upper part of the vagina and the cervix, but there wasn't an opening. The labia were fused. And so that was done when I was uh, just hitting puberty. And then it had to be redone again when I was um, a little bit older in my teens. How many surgeries have you undergone total? Um, a total of four surgeries. There was... Um, uh, urogenital surgery when I was an infant. There was the clitorectomy, and there were two vaginoplasties. So, uh, anatomically, do you, are you okay? Are you can you function normally? What do you mean by function I normally? Know, in the sense of, I mean, do you have difficult like? Um, uh, are you, would you be able to reproduce if you so choose? Could you? Uh, do you have any discomfort? Are you are you okay physically? Um, because I have a uterus and ovaries, and I do have one of the rare types of intersex that does leave fertility intact, um, if I wanted to have kids, I could. That's not a problem, and many women with CAH do have children. As far as, you know, does it look normal? No. Am I okay with it? Absolutely. You know, I'm comfortable in my own skin. Does it have full sensation like an uh, unaffected female? No. You know, they cut my clitoris off of me. It was amputated from me. Am I able to have an orgasm? Yes. You know, the biggest sex organ is up here between my ears. You know, it's all up here. And, in fact, and I'm one of those very lucky women, actually, that I read about. You know, this 2% who can have an orgasm just thinking about it. If, you know, if I got the right visual, things going on and I'm fine. Um, so, but I've learned, I've learned how to compensate, you know, which was just a matter of, you know, almost having to, if I wanted to, you know, be in love and be able to make love with somebody. Now, um, in the time period when, when you were born, when you were born, I mean, do you feel our parents were sort of pressured into making decisions by doctors because there was so little information on this, this subject? Oh, absolutely. My mother didn't think she had a choice. Um, and for, you know, sadly, my mother passed away about a year ago, but we were able to sit down and talk about this before she died. We had a wonderful conversation. It was the first time we ever really talked about it. And she just didn't think she had a choice. You know, she was told that without it, I would be a miserable, unhappy person, possibly be a lesbian, possibly have gender identity issues, and, um, and it needed to be done. And in fact, one of the things when I first started to become active as an intersex activist, she was very worried that I was thinking about transitioning to male, because she was told that if they do the, that if she agreed to the surgery and raised me female and reinforced female, that I would definitely be female. And I am female. I feel female. I don't have any gender identity issues. You know, I don't know if my brain, if my gender necessarily feels female, but. I present female. I'm just am who I am, you know. I'm happy just being Betsy. I'm not really worried about the genders and all that and the gender binary and fitting in. But as I was starting to come out and speaking out, that was a huge, con huge concern of hers. Absolutely huge concern of hers. Now I understand in that time period, um, the doctors always chose to do the surgery as they did on you, 
because it's to, it's easier to remove it than it would be to to rebuild. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is. It is. In so fact, they, there's they always a opted. I'm saying because they always opted to do that, but in a lot of times that wasn't the right choice. In your case, it was. Was it the right choice for me? I don't know. I mean, it left me without my clitoris. Is that the right choice to make for any child? Yeah, to leave no, but to leave I, someone without a clitoris? No, that's not. I don't think that's what I meant. I meant the, the choice to. Um, there's a, the parents are left with the choice: Do you want to make your child male or female? Oh, in some types of intersex situations, that is a, that is um, a decision that parents have to make. And usually it does go female because the surgery is easier. As one very famous doctor quoted at a, at a conference, you know, doing a speech, it's easier to dig a hole than it is to build a pole. Um, however, that's not really a good way to look at it for all, for all the different types of intersex conditions. My situation, for instance, with, you know, having an enlarged clitoris, it was just simply saying, you know, we don't think she's going to be a male, you know, we're not doing a sex reassignment surgery here. We're just taking her away her clitoris because we can't have a little girl running around with a big clitoris. It might give her too much pleasure when it grows up, when she grows up. I mean, I don't know that that's what they thought, but, you know, really, that's what we're talking about. When you remove clitoral tissue, what is the problem? So um, is, there, is there any statistics um, as to how many people are born with this condition? Is there, is, is, are they still sort of in the process of gathering research? Do you mean with CAH? Yes. CAH as an intersex condition only affects females. Males born with CAH are not affected um, within, you know, this the, the genitalia. Mm -hmm. The incidence of CAH itself is about 1 in 15,000. So if we're just talking about the females, it would be about 1 in 30,000. And there's a varying degree as to how virilized the, the child may be. You know, one girl with CAH may have just no no virilization and not be born with an enlarged clitoris. Another girl with CAH may be born with a slightly enlarged clitoris. Another girl might be born with a hugely enlarged clitoris. So it's really hard to say. Mm -hmm. How many are getting surgeries? I don't know, and I don't know that anybody has been really tracking that, um, an overall percentage. Under the, the title of intersex, is there any statistic of how many, how many um, babies are born intersex? I'm reading, the reason I'm asking is I'm reading different numbers. I'm reading 1 in 10,000, 1 in 20,000, 1 in 30,000, and I sure. just didn't know if, if they were even remotely accurate, and I wanted to... Based upon the research of Ann Foster Sterling, we estimate, and I think it's a conservative estimate, but it's the number that we use and that my organization uses, is about 1 in 2,000. And the 1 in 2,000 is the number of births born that are visibly intersexed at birth. However, there are some types of intersex conditions that are not obvious at birth so and may not get discovered until puberty. So when you start to include all of those numbers in there, it could be as high as 1 in 500. And I have actually seen some numbers by some experts who I respect who will say it's even as high as 1 in 250. If you get into the very pure definition of intersex being anything that differs from standard male or female. And I say standard because it's what what medical and society says is standard male and female. You know, there's actual measurements at birth, you know, that a, that a penis must be a certain size at birth, stretched, to qualify to be a healthily, a normally developed penis, and that's about two and a half centimeters. It's the same thing for a clitoris. If a clitoris is larger than about 0.9 centimeters at birth, medically, on the most basic term, is considered to fall outside of standard female. So therefore, they could be considered to be an intersex condition. That's interesting. It is. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> Do we need to expand on that a bit, do you think? Because I think you told it well. I mean, that's okay. unbelievable. You know, I mean, they could make this, you know, yeah. they could do a, a gender reassignment decision based on the size of someone's uh, clitoris or penis? They do do, a gen they do do gender reassignment surgeries based upon the size of uh, clitoris or penis. Usually not based upon the size of a clitoris. They will sometimes reduce the size of the clitoris if it's deemed to be too large by somebody who believes that they have you know, the child's best interest in mind. 
Um, however, they will do periodically sex reassignment surgeries on boys born with something called micropenis. And that is a penis that does not two and a half centimeters stretched at birth. And they presume, they being, you know, doctors and others who think that, you know, this needs intervention, that the child will be happier as a girl. And also being addicted then, we're also subjecting this child to a lifetime of hormone replacement therapy um, as a girl rather than being a male with a small penis. You know, our society places a lot of value on the size of a man's penis, which is very, very sad. One of the things points that I'll often make is when we have a boy born with a hugely enlarged penis, and some boys are born with really, really big penises, and there are men out there with really, really big penises, we don't cut those down in size, even though it may be hugely uncomfortable for the, for a woman if they're having heterosexual sex. It might even be very uncomfortable in other types of sexual acts. Um, but we don't do anything to reduce the size of that. Whereas if it's a woman with a big clitoris, it's like, oh my gosh, we can't have that. We can't have a girl running around with a big clit. She might be a lesbian. Or she might have gender identity disorders. It's the same thing with a boy born with a little penis, that he will not feel man enough. And one of the things we often hear about, and lots and lots of doctors will say this, you can see it in documentary after documentary and interview after interview, well, what about how will they survive the locker room? So what we're doing is we are, you know, what they're doing is they're taking and sacrificing a lifetime of who they are, of who this person is, for that short period of time in the locker room rather than focusing on what the real reason behind that is, and that's society. Society who says, you know, beat up the little boy with a little penis. And if you ask boys and men who were born with small penises, you know, if they would rather have been sexually reassigned as female rather than being themselves with a little penis, they, all, they almost always will say no. They're happy. They learn how to be sexual in other ways. If they can't have, if it's so small that they can't even have penetrative heterosexual sex, or even any type of homosexual sex, or any type of sex for that matter, they compensate. You learn how to compensate. It's the same thing with me with not having my clitoris. I've learned how to compensate with my brain. So you're saying there's a double standard? Absolutely, operation. there's a double standard. Absolutely. You know, a boy has to have a big penis. A girl with a big clitoris is no good. A boy with a little penis is not going to be man enough. And that's a societal problem. Interesting. You can tell I'm, I'm getting comfortable with you, too, now. Yeah. And the whole, yeah. Okay. Um, so we can go back and cover some more questions. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we're kind of jumping around, but it's okay. We're having a conversation, so I appreciate those. No um, problem. Um, I lost my train of thought. I wanted to go somewhere with this conversation, and it just slipped my mind. Could you talk a little bit about, um, you talked about the physical um, toll, and I think it would be nice for the viewers to hear about the emotional impacts you've had on your life because there's people out there that could be making this decision on their child. Because you seem, from meeting you and from side hearing your phone, you seem like a great person, really like to live a, a good life and together. And I know, I know it's been a journey for you. So <laughs> talk to me a little bit about the journey. It has been a journey, Steph. Oh, my goodness, has it been a journey. Um, I'm 40 years old, and I feel like I've just begun that journey still. Growing up, I was not made to feel any different, except that there were all these overnight hospital stays and all these genital checks. And even though nobody ever talked to me about what was different about my body, I knew, knew that something must be so horribly different and horribly wrong with my body and with who I am, you know, to, to get all this attention. Let me ask you a question. You didn't think that that was normal. Like you didn't think every kid would go was doing it. this was happening to every kid. This was just a normal part of life. I thought that it was a normal part of life er, early on. Um, it didn't take me long to realize that it was not a normal part of life uh, because I had friends and my friends didn't have that happening to them. And not that I talked about it because I didn't have the language to talk about it. But I really knew. And in fact, I remember being very young, probably eight or nine years old, and my parents had a, you know, a nice set of World Book Encyclopedia, 
And of course, we're talking long before the internet. So this was my only research. And I remember being about eight or nine years old and looking up, like, what is male and what is female and looking at these pictures and recognizing, going, something's not right here. But again, I didn't have the language. I only had my childhood fears and doubts as to what was going on. And also then, and looking up words like hermaphrodite in, in the encyclopedia at a really young, young age. Where did I learn that from? I don't know. Of course, I probably overheard it throughout the course of my medical treatment. Um, I talked about, you know, very briefly about all these hospital stage, st uh, stays. There were several times as a very young child, and in fact, one of my earliest, earliest memories is of being in the hospital on an overnight stay, and I would go in for a routine blood work and blood testing. It was the 1960s and then early 1970s, so of course hospitals were very different then, and parents were not allowed to stay overnight like they are now with their kids. Plus it was routine. I would do this, I would have this every six to 12 months. And I remember these like gangs of medical residents who would come into my room and like turn the light on in the middle of the night and force my legs apart. And they were basically doing a show and tell and poking around and looking. And I was being used as a medical exhibit, as a learning tool. Um, oh goodness, I was probably six, six, seven. That continued, however, throughout until I was about um, a young teenager. And I just didn't know. I did not know that this was not normal and that this was not right. But that experience in itself would, would, be, would be traumatic. Looking back at it, I, I, I really consider it childhood sexual abuse that was perpetuated upon me in a medical institution. Absolutely. Um, you know, my parents did the best they could to protect me. My parents were lovely, wonderful, wonderful parents. My dad's still alive. I mean, I absolutely, truly love him dearly. Um, my mother did not know that this was occurring. And I did not know how to talk about it because I thought that it was normal. I mean, it's very classic childhood sexual abuse. I thought that, you know, all little kids had this happen to them. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I recognized that for what it was. Betsy, I think we need to make it, um, let the people who are going to see this know, your parents did not inform you of the condition, that you didn't know growing up, correct? I knew that I had a medical condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia because I take medicine for it. And the CAH is also one of the very few types of intersex where there can be a separate medical emergency that is associated with it. I take medicine, you know, the medicine's twofold. Um, I take it, number one, to stay alive because my body doesn't produce enough hormones and enough cortisone and doesn't, my adrenal glands don't work properly. I mean, without getting into, you know, science and medical, my adrenal glands don't work properly. Do you still take medication? I do. Oh, I take I it daily. Um, Did you say that again? I think I stepped on you. I'm just yeah. saying I do. I take it daily. I do take medicine, and I take it daily. Um, however, one of the things I learned as an adult is the purpose of that medicine is twofold. Because my body produces a lot of androgens, that, you know, virilizing hormones, Without taking that medicine, if I didn't have the life-threatening aspect as well, I would masculinize very quickly. I would get facial hair. I would get male pattern baldness. I would probably develop a male pattern mu muscular structure and could probably physically, at least appearance-wise, transition to a very male-looking person very quickly without the use of any testosterone or other hormones. I never learned that as a child which was very bizarre. As I've learned that as an adult, what I've done is I've cut back. I do a lot of self-medicating, which of course all the doctors out there are going to go, oh my goodness, don't do that. But I've learned how to balance that out, to just take enough to stay alive and be happy with who I am and how I look. And of course, I'm not virilizing, so it's not that big of a deal. But some women will that have CAH. But you see, that stuff was never told to me. That was part of the whole secret. The surgeries were never told to me. The clitorectomy was never shared with me. Even the vaginoplasty at my very early teens, I was, you know, 12. I was very sexually immature, you know, because there was never any really sex education that went along growing up, the birds and the bees, which, of course, because I was different. And I think that what happened is nobody knew how... <clears throat> 
because I was different, and of course nobody knew how to talk about that with me. You know, how do we explain that? You know, normally we would explain that little girls do this and little boys do that, and of course, and I was kind of somewhere in between. So there was silence. The night before I had the vaginoplasty, the first vaginoplasty done, that is creation of a vagina opening, um, they did send a therapist up to see me who gave me a wonderful biology lesson that was way over the head of a 12-year-old trying to explain why I was born without a vagina. That didn't really matter. I needed to know why my body was just different. And so there was very little counseling offered by the medical caregivers, those involved with my uh, medical care. There was some as I was a late teen. Did it get into too much of the surgeries and all that? You know, I do remember an instance when I was probably 18 or 19 year old, 18 or 19 years old, and having the physician who treated me as a teenager, um, she was not involved with my care as a young child when these surgeries were done, that said, you know, I'm sorry, but you had a full clitorectomy done on you. Did I know what that full clitorectomy meant and how it would impact me? No, because I wasn't sexually active at the time. I had no clue. You know, I mean, I was just trying to survive. I wasn't about to be taking, taking my clothes off in front of anybody and exposing my queer body to them. Um, growing up then throughout my young adulthood and, you know, negotiating the dating scene and, you know, and re recognizing that I was also a lesbian, that, you know, I tried dating boys, but, you know, never had any sex with them. Um, never even allowed anybody to get even close to my genitals. And then trying to deny the fact that I was a lesbian. And then growing up and as a young adulthood, and the first time I had sex with a woman as a young adult in college was when I realized just how different I really was. And it just blew me away. Absolutely, positively blew me away. And was that traumatic difference? Or was it... Oh, it was hugely traumatic. You know, that realization of that first sexual encounter was huge. Uh, you know, because I didn't know, oh my gosh, what is it? You know, how just how queer and how different my body was. And I'm thankful that that woman who I was with that one time in college for that first time did not make that big of an issue out of it. And it was a huge relief for me. However, there was nothing ever pursued again because I was like just so shamed by it and so embarrassed by it as to how do I talk about this? How do I preface this be before becoming sexually active with somebody? The end result of that was is I basically didn't become sexually active again for a long time. There was a second time then, a few years later, where I again had a sexual encounter with a woman. And then I learned afterwards that her reaction was very different. And although her reaction to me, to my face, was fine, the reaction of her telling all my friends in college and other people I knew that I was a hermaphrodite was horrible. I mean, it damaged me. It damaged me beyond belief. So again, I didn't date for several years. I kept to myself. And, and I still didn't quite know what the deal was. I was away at college. I was, you know, on my own as a young adult. And I didn't know really how to proceed with this information or what to do with it. So I basically, I was just flying under the radar for a real long time. I ended up then in a relationship for about seven years with a woman. It was a good relationship. Um, she was fine with it. But again, I don't know that we, that either of us had the language or understanding as to what was so different about my body other than it was different. And she really liked it. You know, I do have, without getting into too many details about, you know, what's between my legs. Um, even though I don't have a clitoris, I've got, you know, some other, other, um, some other attributes <laughs> that, are, that can be fun and can be used um, to make sex enjoyable. When we broke up out of that relationship, it really wasn't the fact of the breakup that really traumatized me. It was the fact of the realization that I was going to have to start dating again.
I mean, I didn't have to start dating again, but eventually I would want to start dating again, and I'm going to have to negotiate this whole fact of my body being different. Eventually, I did start dating again, and I met a woman who really, she probably doesn't know it, and in fact, if she watches this, maybe she'll recognize herself. Um, I started dating a woman. We had wonderful sex, absolutely, positively wonderful sex, and she encouraged me to find out some answers, and she knew what intersex was, and I did not yet. I didn't have a computer at the time. Um, I was still trying to fly under the radar, and she encouraged me to learn more. And I did. And then she broke up with me. <laughs> but that was okay, you but know. You, you know what's interesting is I find in life everybody has a message for you to help you get to the next level, and that's what's cool for you. Well, this woman, absolutely, she came into my life. We had this um, torrent affair for a little while. She lived in L.A., and I was in Atlanta. And she encouraged me to find out more, and I did. And I got myself a computer. And one of the first things I did was type in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. I still didn't quite know intersex. And what I learned, number one, I learned that I was not the only one out there with a body like mine. I really thought that I was the only person out there with a body like, my own, like mine. Of all the millions and millions of people in the world, I was alone in, the, in that shame, or so I thought. And I went online and I started reading, and I started reading stories from other women. And I started to write my own stories. And I started to share my own stories, and I started to post this stuff on the internet. And I also did seek some counseling at the time, and there had been counselors, you know, mental health caregivers, therapists that I had gone in and out of to see periodically before this time, in and out. Nobody was ever able to nail down what my issue was. But a lot of that, again, they didn't draw it out of me, and I didn't know what my issue was, you know. I did not know what was behind the self-esteem problems. I did not know what was behind the shame that I was experiencing. I thought it was because I was a lesbian. But it wasn't. And I realized that when I came out as a lesbian, and I came out fairly young, I was in my young 20s when I realized, and I came out to my friends, you know, and I've been out with an employment for years, I mean, longer than I can even remember. But the, re the realization that perhaps the self-esteem problems were because of my queer body really started to bring it all together for me. So I ended up going to see this therapist right after this woman who I talked about. And I said, you know, I have something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Do you think that has anything to do with what I'm going through and what I'm experiencing? And she thought about it for a moment and thought, nah, and said, ah, I don't think so. Well, it hit me then. I've got some other issues to deal with. And so I dropped her, stopped going. And I basically began a period of healing and, and self-realization and healing, wrote my story, posted it on the Internet, and started to hear from other women with the same thing. And it just opened up a huge world to me. And since that time, since that kind of epiphany that I went through, you know, things have been great. You know, I'm happy in my skin. I'm not ashamed to date. I don't have a problem explaining to anybody who I want to, you know, have sex with, whether relationship or otherwise, what's different about my body. I tell them. I've learned how to compensate for that very, very nicely, actually, whereas when I am with a woman and in a relationship, it's great sex. It's absolutely great sex. But I had to become comfortable in my own body, and I had, had to know the answers, and I had to know the vocabulary about my own body before I could learn that. And that was never given to me growing up. It was never given to me by my parents. It was never given to me by the few mental health caregivers that the hospital where I was treated at attempted to provide. You know, because they were, they, the, the caregivers were, were underqualified themselves. 
They were following the rules of the shame and the, of, of the secrecy. Don't share. Concealment-centered protocol. If we don't tell her what's going on, she'll be okay. It was never given to me by those doctors. It was never given to me by anybody. And it wasn't things in the, it's anything that was in the newspaper. And until I discovered it on the computer, on my own, I was helpless. And I was just wandering, fl trying to fly under the radar. Um, in, in your discussions with people on the internet, and this may take our conversation in a whole new direction, uh, and th I think we need to clear up, not every person who, who is intersex is a lesbian. I mean, we need to make that. <coughs> I mean, that is correct. Not every person who, is an who, is, who has an intersex condition is a lesbian. Um, not every person who has an intersex condition identifies as female. There are some men with intersex conditions who do not have any type of surgery because there are so many different types of intersex conditions. I mean, there are, the variation is just incredible. And while there are not a lot of studies that are studying, you know, the rate of, of homosexuality and intersex conditions or the relationship between homosexuality and intersex, there are some conditions where anecdotally you see a higher incidence of homosexuality, whether gay male or lesbian or bisexual. And for instance, with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, I know a lot of women with congenital, with the CAH, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, who identify as lesbian or bisexual. However, is there research to back it up? No. Is there research to disprove it? No problem is, is it hasn't really been studied that well. There are some small studies that occur, but they are small, and they're small samples. But to give you an, an, an idea as to the role, perhaps, is homosexuality genetic, let me put this out here for you to think about. There's a higher incidence of, of lesbianism, of women, there's a higher incidence of women, let me start that over again, there's there's a higher incidence of women who are lesbians than there is within the general unaffected population. Okay, these are women that are yes. XX. Sex. Okay, there's <clears throat> sorry. There's a higher incidence of women with CAH who are lesbian than there is within the general population. I mean that is a fact. That is studied. There are some small studies out there um, that show that. Is it a huge amount? No but it is higher than what we would see in the unaffected population. These are women, XX genetically, that is, they're female genetically. They have a uterus, they have ovaries, they identify as female, usually, not all, but usually identify as female. And have this, a lot of testosterone that they're, that they're subjected to, that they're exposed to in utero. And so therefore, so these women have a higher incidence of lesbianism. And I can repeat this, by the way, to kind of put this all together. No, that's good. I think you said it short. You, at the same account, you have women with something called androgen insensitivity syndrome. That is, these are women who are XY genetically, are born looking female. A lot of times they're not diagnosed until at, well after birth with AIS, whose <clears throat> bodies do not excuse me, whose bodies do not respond to testosterone that well. So they do not masculinize. So they look female. Their body is producing the testosterone, but their body is not um, sensitive to it. Most women with AIS, not all, but most, are heterosexual. So what does that tell you? Here you have somebody who's XY genetically you would think that they would uh, automatically be attracted to other women. But they're not. They're attracted to men. And generally, physical appearance uh, is female. Oh, there's no doubt that a woman with, with complete AIS is a woman. There's absolutely no doubt. I'm just a little confused on what the, then what the symptoms of AIS would be other than a... Well, they're, they're, they're born looking female. Mm -hmm. They have XY. They're genetically XY, okay. which is what is considered standard male but their body doesn't react to testosterone. So they, they grow up, they have a female gender identity usually, they look female, they act female, 
They identify as female. Um, and again, if you saw a woman with AIS who did not, you know, who didn't have her clothes on, you would think that that's a woman. But There'd be no has, doubt. But she has male. But she has male chromosomes. But male organs. No. 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 Exactly. She may have. Um, I don't want to get into too much of the medical because no, I'm not no, a medical no, person. She it's may it's have um, undescended testes. They're generally removed before puberty to keep the uh, testosterone out. But this is a woman. There is no doubt that you would think. And a lot of these women with AIS identify as heterosexual. They are attracted to men. So do you think as a society we just maybe need to start the conversation that there may be more than two sexes? There's more, it's not just male and female? Similar way in testosterone studies five sexes. Um, well, you know, and... You know, and that, you know what? <laughs> I can leave that question to her. She can talk about that, and I think I will use her in this piece. So let you know, Okay. Her, you know, uh, so let me just address that real quickly. Sure. Since we can jump around, um, thank goodness to cutting and splicing and editing. Um, I know it's tape, but I say that anyways. I'm an old radio person who used to splice tapes. <laughs> we used to splice quarter inch tape. Um, the intersex advocacy movement, for the most part, at least those that are out there and working to change the medical protocol and working towards acceptance of intersex do not advocate raising a child outside of male or female. We advocate raising a child on the most likely outcome based upon what is known without doing any surgical reinforcement and with the understanding that initial determinations may be wrong. And until the child tells us who they are and what gender they are, that is male or female. We have no way of knowing. When you have an infant who's six or eight months old, you have no way of knowing if that child is going to identify as male or female. At what age can you, do you think is, is accurate or to begin to see? Most children will start to identify um, and express their gender by about the age of two. There's a study that's out there, and I'm sure that um, Ann Foster Sterling is aware of it, and you could ask her. Whereas children at about the age of two can identify other boys and girls in a crowd before they can identify people of different ethnic backgrounds. I think one of the most interesting case studies... Can I finish? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, some adults with intersex do identify outside of the standard male or female binary, and that's great. You know, people who don't have intersex identify outside of the standard male or female binary, and that's great. People as adults have the right and should be allowed to identify however they want and whoever they want to be. However, I don't think it's the responsibility of anybody born with an intersex condition to work at erasing the gender binary. Most people with intersex do identify as male or female. And actually, most identify in the gender that they were raised in. It's only a small but not insignificant number, key word being insignificant there. A small but not insignificant number of people with intersex do change genders from what they were raised in. They don't always identify as transsexual or transgender. Quite often, they're just reclaiming what was stolen from them in childhood, particularly if there was a sex reassignment that was done during infancy. But, you know, I think it's great. But those theorists and the ethicists out the theorists and the scholars out there who say, oh, you know, intersex people should be treated as a third gender or third sex, that's, that's baloney. You know what? Uh, let me identify how I want to identify. I would never ask you to identify as something other than you are. And the other issue is, is to ask a parent of a newborn child to raise their child without a gender or without a sex is very unfair, both to the family and to the child. You're putting an entire another layer of stigma on top of the situation that you already have at hand. You know, gender, male or female assignment, is a social and legal requirement in our society, and it must be done. But you can do it without surgically reinforcing it, and you can do it with the understanding that things may change.
And until that child tells us, we're not going to know who they are. So, so parents that uh, um, uh, a child was born intersex, what, ste what steps should be taken immediately? And what, what would you advise parents uh, to do in, in a situation? Like Breathe. 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 There's no rush. Even though everybody in the, in the delivery room is acting like there's a big rush, there isn't unless there's an absolute medical emergency that needs to be treated immediately. There is no rush. Genitals that look different are not diseased. Gen genitals that look different will not kill you. Genitals that look different are okay. They just look different. When you really want to get down to it, it's really no different than having a child born with any other physical difference from what is standard, ma from what is considered standard. If you have a child born with a huge nose, you're not going to be rushing that child off to surgery. Look at it the same way. You know, it's recognized and it's understood that, you know, it's a huge shock. You, when you have a parent who has a child born with an intersex condition and they've never heard about it before, that's a scary place for any parent to be. It's a scary place for anyone to be. It throws into question everything that we come to assume. And that is what makes us male or female. Is it our genitals? Is it our chromosomes? Is it our gender identity? Is it the way you perceive our, my gender identity? Who's to say? And uh, all of that gets questioned. But you can breathe, spend some time. If you don't have a computer, go to the library and look it up ask lots of questions, write letters, contact the uh, organizations that are out there working, to, working on intersex advocacy and ask them what they think. Ask your doctor if, you, if they have any other parents who have dealt with this and how you can, and if you can meet them. Ask to meet adults. When they say that the surgery must be done before the age of 12, it doesn't need to be done. You need to ask them very, very specific questions about it because otherwise you will be led down a path which you may regret and your child may regret very, very deeply at some point later. One of the big things that's very difficult for parents to understand is when you're holding that infant and that infant is just a few days old and you don't know if this child's going to be male or female, you need to move past that. You need to think about 20 years down the line when this person becomes a sexually active human being. And that's really difficult for parents to think about. And what will happen to that child's sexual happiness? You need to think about that child's future sexual happiness when they are sexually active. You, need to you can't assume that that child's going to be heterosexual or gay or lesbian or bisexual. You just have no way of knowing. And so you need to think about these things before you, you move and act on it. So it seems like there needs to be a, almost sort of some immediate counseling for the parents on the issue. And, and is that available to parents? Someone like yourself going in and explaining what you've just explained to me. Because it would obviously be sort of more, you know... Because if originally, from what I understand, uh, traditionally there was a, considered a social emergency and a rush to surgery, and everybody shut up about it, and it wasn't spoken about again similar to your case, correct? That is correct. I mean, the con what we call within the advocacy movement is the concealment-centered protocol. That is, rush it to surgery, don't talk about it, and everything will be fine. But that's not the case. Can you say that again? Just for the background. Okay. Yeah, because that was good. Rush to surgery. <coughs> you can go... That up? It's... Oh, okay, oh, when, that one, when that one hit, that one... Can you shut that door? But it can go almost all the way shut. All right. Yeah. Yeah, and they know you're up there. Okay. Really sure. okay. Say that again. That was good. Um, what did I say? Generally rush to surgery. Oh, the current concealment-centered protocol is still being practiced by many hospitals in the United States. Not all. Some are changing. Is to rush the child to surgery. That is usually before about the age of 12 to 18 months. Don't say anything. Don't talk about it. Often parents are not told exactly what's happening. They're not told that, you know, perhaps clitoral surgery will be done or what's going on. 
Parents are scared, so they're willing to follow whatever the doctor says. And then one of the key parts about the concealment sentry protocol is to not talk about it. Generally, there is not the enlistment of a qualified mental health caregiver. There's often not the enlistment of a social worker. There's often not the enlistment of a medical ethicist, which is a very big deal. There should be a medical ethicist involved in this decision. Parents are not told that these surgeries are generally still experimental. They're experimental because there is no follow-up data that proves that it improves the child's quality of life. It just isn't out there. They're not told that there's that the surgeries themselves are a point of contention amongst many. What happens when a child is born, the child and the parents are almost a victim of where, they're, where, where this birth takes place and often who's on call. Depending upon, I mean, the state of intersex treatment in the United States right now, because there are no guidelines, what happens to that child is almost dependent upon who's on call that day or that night in the hospital where they're born as to what will happen throughout the rest of that child's life and as far as surgery goes. Um, that's why you need to breathe. You need to get other opinions. You need to talk to people. The concealment center protocol, as I mentioned, does not generally involve the use of, care, of mental health caregivers. One of the big issues that is in dispute as to whether or not parents are even able to give informed consent for cosmetic surgery on their child. In almost all cases, this surgery that's being done is purely cosmetic in nature. So how far have we advanced <coughs> since um, your experience with the combination of information like your groups have put out there, people talking about it, plus new, tech, new medical techniques? Are, are we... Uh, is there n new alternatives now for parents and, or for, for people who have grown up without making a medical decision at this point? There's very, not that many adults who have grown up without surgery. Most adults who um, are out there have had surgery of one sort or another. There are some who have not. They very tend to be very happy that they have not had surgery and they would not choose it as an adult on their own. Um, the internet is making huge strides. It is making information available that may not be otherwise available to some parents. Um, it's making information available that perhaps doctors are not sharing with um, the parents, for instance. It's also allowing people to talk to other parents, and that's huge. I mean, it, it, it's sad in a way. I mean, it should be different. There should be in-person, face-to-face networks set up, peer support networks set up amongst parents locally, but that's not happening yet because a lot of times people are still, you know, living in shame and secrecy and they don't want to talk about it, particularly, particularly in person. That's changing slowly, and I think we can thank the Internet for it. The work of the advocacy movement is slowly moving forward. The doctors are paying attention to it. People are paying attention to what we're saying and what we're doing. They are reacting to it. They are starting to do more studies. There's a lot more media attention now on the issue, and it's legitimate media attention that is not shameful, that's not ridiculing people. This is not what has been done in the past in, you know, network news magazines where they put the person with the intersex condition behind a potted plant. More people are starting to come out of the closet. More people are starting to speak up and saying, this is my story. This is my history. This is what was done to me. Ironically, as an advocate doing peer support, we see with bodies like ours three points of contact that occurs. We often will hear from parents of a newborn, often on our message boards, who will post and say, you know, how should I do this or what should I do? Or we'll hear it directly. We'll often hear from parents when their child is a teenager and there's self-esteem issues or perhaps self-harming or drug and alcohol abuse. And they're reacting, you know, and they've been raised under this protocol of shame and secrecy and now all of a sudden parents are realizing, geez, Perhaps I should have talked about this with the child 
and they have it. And then everything gets quiet. And then we hear from people with the intersex, you know, those with intersex themselves, by about the late, when they hit their late 20s, mid to, and that's coming down, that's coming down quickly as the internet is becoming more and more prevalent. But mid to late 20s to early 30s, and they're starting to realize going, wait, what is with my body? What is up here? Am I the only one? And they're realizing that they're not. When a child is born with intersex, chances are the parents have never heard of this, no matter what the condition is. And there's so many different conditions. So, I mean, just using intersex as the umbrella term, with one, a child is born with one type of intersex. Parents have never heard about this. And yet it's about one in 2,000 live births. That's about the same number of people born with cystic fibrosis, which everybody's heard about. It's about the same number born with Down syndrome. Everybody's heard about that. And they're aware that these things can happen. But nobody's ever sharing with, you know, expectant parents going, this might be an issue that you're going to face. There is a 1 in 2,000 chance that you're going to be facing this issue. Perhaps you should think about it now, what you're going to do. And if parents can be prepared ahead of time, half the battle will be won. Half of our battle is intersex, intersex advocates, you know, promoting a better patient-centered protocol will be born because there won't be that panic and parents will be prepared. And hopefully they'll know what some of the issues are before they get scared and before that, you know, codependency sets up between parents and physician. One of the other issues that occurs when there's a child that's born is the parent becomes the patient. Everybody's concerned, well, we have to do this for the parents. You know, the parents won't be able to bond with the child. The parents this. The parents are scared. The parents are traumatized. What will the parents tell their friends and neighbors? It's all about the parents, and the child gets forgotten about. So we're fixing the child. We're changing the child. We're surgically altering the child to make the parents happy. And there's something wrong with that equation. There's a lot of surgeons out there and physicians out there who will tell you that things are different now, that people like Betsy Driver have no business talking about this because what was done to me isn't being done anymore. And to a certain extent, that's true. But just because technique has changed does not justify the fact that these surgeries are still cosmetic in nature. Anytime you cut tissue, I don't care if you have the best technique in the world and have won a Nobel Prize for it, anytime you cut tissue, you're going to leave scar tissue. And unfortunately, the technique that's being done today, that's being held up as, you know, the gold standard, we still will not know the results of that so-called new gold standard technique until the child who was subjected to it grows up and becomes a sexually active adult. There's absolutely no way for us to tell. You can put all the probes you want on a clitoris to see if you're getting, you know, nerve sensation. But until that child grows up and can say, yes, doctor, this clitoris works, we don't know that. The other issue that happens is constantly changing techniques also lead to a situation where when that person is grown up, we don't even bother asking her if the technique works because they've already moved on to new techniques. And they'll say that, well, her opinion is invalid because we're not doing that technique anymore. You know, that does not overcome the fact that this child had cosmetic genital surgery done on her without her consent. And while they may not be doing full clitorectomies anymore in the United States, how many, are, how many surgeries are botched? How many clitorises do come off because you're working on a really small piece of tissue? And then that aspect and that little mistake is never shared. I'm not convinced it doesn't happen. I'm convinced that it does happen based upon what I've heard from people. I was surprised at the number of um, uh, mistakes made during circumcision. Yeah. And then one, and one of the base cases for intersex, which was not an intersex case at all, was John Jones, where they made the mistake of, of circumcision and of the twins, and they told the parents, well, you know, look, we basically cut his dick off, so let's just make him a girl, mm -hmm. raise him as a girl. And I mean, that was a documented, fascinating story. However, not intersex, a case study where gender reassignment is not successful. He eventually killed himself when he was...
Yeah. There are. Um, well, yeah. No, I can right. give you. There are some who have sex reassignment done on them, some with intersex who have sex reassignment done on them as a child, and they do identify in that gender that they were raised in and were assigned. That's not unheard of. However, a lot of them um, do go back to the gender and sex that was stolen from them through that sex reassignment surgery. A common misperception by a lot, uh, both within academia, uh, within society, by some news organizations, as well as by a lot of transsexual organizations, is that intersex is some, f some form of transsexuality, or vice versa, that transsexuality is a subset of intersex. And that's not correct. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, intersex is something that you were born with. It's a congenital condition. And there will be those who will say, well, transsexuality is something I was born with as well. And that I'm intersex in the brain. According to the current definitions of intersex, they're two different things. One of the things I often will mention is that, you know, they, although we are very uh, allied and we work together, and I like working with, you know, the trans organizations. I, I look at them as allies. I look at them as great co-conspirators in the big picture of the world. Uh, but I look at us as having different agendas. You know, they want access to the health care and surgery, and they should get that. We want the surgery to stop until the person who has that body can make up their own mind about it. We don't have an issue with anybody born with an intersex condition choosing to have surgery at some point in their lives when they are old enough and can legally give informed consent for it. That's great. If you want to have surgery, absolutely go for it. We have issues with it taking place in childhood because it's generally irreversible. It cannot be undone. Once it's done, it's done. One of the problems with convoluting the two issues is it confuses people. And it doesn't do the trans movement any good because it distinguishes away from what their needs are, and their very important needs. And it doesn't benefit the intersex movement as well because it, it distracts from what the needs of the intersex movement is. Part of the problem that this has come up about is because of this whole trend for a lot of organizations to change their acron acronyms to LGBTI, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, and intersex. By including that I, you're implying that intersex is a behavior, which it is not, that intersex is a gender identity, it is not, that intersex is a sexual orientation, it is not. It's none of that stuff. Whereas when, trans, when you get into transgender and transsexuality, you're saying that this is a sex, this is a form of sexuality, this is a form of gender. That's not the case with intersex. Intersex is something that's often a physical difference, an absolute, positively physical difference that people are trying to hide and change and make different to suit their own purposes. Whereas that's not the case with transsex. The issue with the, homo with the you know, homosexuality and lesbian and gay and bi, you know, we within the intersex movement have looked to the uh, LGBT movement. And we have looked to them for guidance. We have looked to them for assistance as the movement has grown. The intersex movement is only about 10 years old. I mean, we are still pre-Stonewall in our activism and in our awareness as to where we're going with this. But because there's a lot of marginalization within the queer movement, the LGBT movement, there is that marginalization, there is that shame. We have looked at them and as that model to help us through this. You know. Somebody who has only experienced the stigmatization of being homosexual, homosexual in this society that seems to hate us so much can understand what it's like to have your body physically changed for the same reason, you know, for the same root reason, I should say, you know, when they do this. So we've looked at that quite a bit, but not everybody with intersex is LGBT, and that really needs to be made very clear. A lot of people with intersex are happy heterosexuals procreating throughout the world. They're just living their lives happy as can be. The one underlying thread, however, that I see and hear from, from a lot of folks, 
is that while they're happy and they're living their lives and perhaps they have kids and their parents who are really upset about the surgeries that were done on them. And even if they have no intention of ever coming out of the closet as somebody who was born with a queer body, they would like these surgeries to stop. I wanted to talk about... Actually, I wanted... There was something else I wanted to talk to you about. Mm. And I know this was... I, I don't want to go into this too much, but the doctor did talk to me about the new research in the area of... Um, he talked about it briefly. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I, I relay this properly. The... Um, they can do detection. If, if, if a woman is intersex, she has a one in eight chance of having an intersex child. This is according to the doctor. And he told me that in that case, they could give the woman... Dexamethasone. Or some other hormone. To prevent, I would just say hormone. To prevent a potential intersex baby from having issues. But they haven't done any research on what would happen to the other seven, quote-unquote, mm -hmm. normally born child. <coughs> just hypothetically... Yeah. Would you, like if your mother had that choice when you were young, do you think that would have been a choice that would have been good for her to make? I have very strong feelings about the use of uh, prenatal hormones to prevent what to be to be. Prenatal hormones are sometimes being used where there is a history of some type of intersex condition. The only thing that those prenatal hormones will often do is reduce the amount of virilization. It will not make other issues go away. There may still be some virilization. We just don't know exactly what the long-term outcome of that is. And again, just like with surgeries, nobody has done any follow-up studies yet. So somebody who was given dexamethasone or some other hormone prenatally, how will they be when they grow up? Will they have you know, any mental health issues? We don't know. We just have no clue. So you may have a girl who's born with a smaller clitoris, but at what cost? It's hard to say. One of the issues also that goes on, and I've made this point once at a medical conference, that using my own situation, if I was born with, you know, I was born with an intersex condition, if my mother and I had surgery, if my mother had taken dexamethasone or any other hormone to try and prevent the virilization that I was born with for the next child, how would that make me feel? Would that make me feel just so horrible that something was wrong with my body that bad that something needed to be done to, to prevent another child with a body like mine? I don't know if that makes me feel very good. You know, it kind of makes me feel really unwanted and very ugly when I really think about that. Another issue with genetic testing is that there's a lot of children that are aborted because they carry a gene that could cause an intersex condition. It's, so, it's considered to be so horrible that it would be better to abort that child. And that child would probably be a very good, contributing, functioning member of society, but better to abort than have a child born with intersex. And, and as pro-life, uh, excuse me, as pro-choice as I am, that bothers me. Is that, is that an option that is presented to women who... Yes. Is? Oh, yes. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. They test for different conditions. They test for things like Klinefelter's, which is a chromosome variation, or Turner syndrome, which is a chromosome variation. And women with who carry this gene are often... And the, if the child, if it's showing up in the child, the child has that gene, will often be offered abortion. And that's, that's kind of sad. And it makes me... You know, it's just ugly. Um, um, we wanted to talk about, I think we're out of time, that was good, so I want to say, we want to talk about your organization, yeah. and I think uh, Bodies Like Ours. Bodies Like Ours is, uh, was founded in late 2001. Uh, the planning, I should say, for Bodies Like Ours began in late 2001. It was kind of interesting how it happened. As I became more familiar with my own intersex condition and began to talk to other people, and meet other people with it. I would have been fine. I would have been fine just getting on with my life and saying, you know, this really stinks. The surgery that was done to me stinks. It's awful. Nothing I can do about it. I'll get over it. I'll move on and live my life. But when I learned that parents today are still having surgery forced upon them 
and upon their kids no differently than what my mother had done to her and that what I had done to me today in U.S. hospitals. That really upset me. When I learned that five children a day are still being subjected to cosmetic genital surgery in the United States alone, that upset me. That is so unnecessary. And so that pretty much moved me to starting to speak out. It moved me to come out of the closet as somebody with an intersex condition. It moved me to speak out. And it moved me to see if I could make change in this world. I became involved with the Intersex Society of North America somewhat. I started to speak out at the urging of Cheryl Chase. And as I began to do that, I realized that there was really no outlet for adults. There was no outlet for easy to understand peer support information, whether for adults or for adults or for teenagers, for nobody. And ISNA was moving very quickly into the medical advocacy end, and they're doing a wonderful job changing medical protocol. They are getting hospitals to pay attention to them. They're getting hospitals to change the way that intersex is treated. They're getting hospitals to adopt a patient-centered protocol. They're getting hospitals to involve medical ethicists. They're getting hospitals to involve mental health caregivers. They're getting hospitals to involve some peer support for parents. They're getting hospitals to give better informed consent to parents before a surgery is chosen. That's really wonderful. I mean, they are changing medical history. Bodies, bodies like ours came along because to fill that peer support void. You know, well, what about those who have already had this done to them? What about all the adults who are out there thinking they're the only ones in the world? Bodies like ours is a peer support organization primarily for people born with intersex. However, we do make services available for parents of children born with intersex. Those services basically include hooking them up with adult survivors or other parents in their area. Earlier this spring, the City of San Francisco and the City of San Francisco Human Rights Commission began what is a very exciting process. They held the first ever governmental public hearing about intersex issues known to occur in the United States. On that night in May, several people with intersex conditions showed up and they testified before the Human Rights Commission. Parents showed up as well. Scholars and medical ethicists showed up as well. The overwhelming theme that was repeated time after time after time during that evening, that public hearing, was how damaging the current medical protocol and the current medical state of affairs is. As a result of that public hearing, the Human Rights Commission and the Intersex Task Force of the Human Rights Commission in San Francisco has been preparing a report that will include medical findings, social findings, ethical findings, as well as recommendations in all three of those, medical recommendations, ethical recommendations, and social recommendations. If this report is adopted, and hopefully it will be adopted by the time this airs, the impact that this report will have on the current state of affairs for intersex treatment in the United States is going to be dramatic. It dramatically changes the way informed consent will be given. It dramatically changes the way that it dramatically changes the requirements of hospitals and at least those licensed in San Francisco and who received city funding will need to treat intersex, including peer support, including informed consent, and including social changes that go on as well. It's very exciting. It will definitely make a big impact in the treatment of intersex in the United States. If San Fran the, San Francisco, uh, the San Francisco action will dramatically alter the way intersex is treated, both in the United States hospitals and I believe socially, if it's adopted. Late last summer, late in summer of 2003, I received a memo in my mailbox that was sent to me by a friend up in Hartford, Connecticut. This memo was released by the Children's Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, the Central Connecticut Children's Medical Center. And it was an announcement for continuing education medical credits, continuing medical education credits, announcing a visiting lecture by a surgeon who does a lot of intersex surgeries. He does a lot of them. 
and he was going to be giving grand rounds. And the next day, he was going to be making available, and the hospital was going to be making available a surgical procedure being done on a child that was available for viewing within the hospital for others seeking CME credit. So basically what we had happening was a child whose surgery was going to be publicly displayed by those qualified to show up and watch, and she probably didn't know it. Did she give consent to have that, that surgery broadcast throughout the hospital? I don't know. Did her parents give consent? I don't know. When we received the memo, we did not know how old the child was. I still don't know how old the child was. I have been told different ages. I have been told different things. I never investigated how old the child was. It didn't matter. The issue that occurred with this situation was the fact that they were making this surgery publicly available for viewing. They were violating this child's privacy, and they were using her as a medical tool. They were using her to teach other people what to do. It's not the responsibility of those with intersex to be medical tools or learning tools. It's not our responsibility. It's no more the responsibility for, any, for somebody born with any type of physical difference to be the teaching tool for others. And that's what upset us. So we organized a very small protest. It was not big. It was about 20 people. It was on a very early on a Friday morning. It was drizzly. We were out there in front of the hospital in Hartford, you know, just raising awareness about intersex, which was really the whole point. We weren't out after canceling the surgery. We weren't out to change medical protocol in this hospital. We used it to raise awareness as to what was happening in that hospital. I suspect that most people in Hartford do not know that they're doing genital mutilations in their, in their beloved children's hospital in downtown Hartford, Connecticut. People need to know that their children's hospitals that they love and care so much about are doing these surgeries, and they're doing them frequently. And they're doing them in ways that perhaps shouldn't be done. And they're making, you know, spectacles out of children. You know, by broadcasting this, this procedure, it basically made a spectacle out of her. Do you think from their point of view they were thinking this is a teaching and learning tool to, to maybe better help intersex people in the future? The, from the medical uh, community's perspective, to me it almost seems like, uh, it does seem invasive, but it seems like it could be a tool to better help intersex people and to educate doctors on the, on the you know? You know, there's two sides to every story. And, as, and I can see their side by saying, well, this is a tool, how else are we going to learn? But that's the same thing that the medical residents were told when they came in and sexually abused me as a child. It's the same exact thing. How else are we going to learn? Well, you don't need to be learning at my expense. There's lots of pictures and textbooks. Perhaps the doctors promoting these big new techniques should learn how to be better teachers without having to, you know, invade the privacy of a child. One Perhaps they should also, getting back also real quickly to, to Connecticut, when we were planning this, one of the things we brought up is we said, well, if you're going to be there teaching the new techniques, why don't you have somebody in saying, you know, this is what the intersex advocacy movement is saying. This is what the intersex movement is doing. This is what adults are doing. They blew us off. And so there we were. There we were on a Friday morning. Eventually, they did invite us in. And one of our representatives, rep one of our representatives went and did a grand rounds and a panel discussion at that same hospital. They listened. They learned more about some of the issues. They learned more about what we were doing. So overall, was it a success? Yes. I'm sorry that, you know, some people feel that perhaps it was not good. One of the things that bodies like ours did not do, we never made it about the child. Other people did make it about the child. I mean, there were messages on message boards, particularly those frequented by children, who were saying things about the child that we didn't know. We had no clue, and we weren't interested in knowing. This wasn't about the child. 
This was about the fact to raise awareness that they're doing these surgeries there, to raise awareness that they are broadcasting these surgeries for anybody who wants to earn CME credits. You know, I could be qualified. If I was a nurse, I could be qualified to, learn, to get CME credit. I could have walked into that hospital and watched that surgery. And that's, that's not right. That is absolutely not right. How, so how is the relationship now between um, advocacy groups and the medical community? Depends upon what, what uh, intersex group you're talking about. Um, is, the the relate is the communication beginning to be there? Because yes. it sounds like you guys need to work together. Yeah. The Intersex Society of North America is making great headway into that. You know, they're being invited into the hospitals. They're talking to the doctors. The doctors are listening to them, and the doctors are talking. There is communication right there. Um, ironically, and I heard an interview recently with Alice Drager on Gender Talk, where she said, you know, the funny thing is, is the medical community is looking at ISNA like the conservative end of the intersex advocacy movement, but they haven't changed anything. Their message hasn't changed over the course of 10 years. However, organizations like Bodies Like Ours have come along, and we're a little bit louder, we take a different tact. We're not, in, we're not, our focus is not getting in the doors of the medical hospitals and the medical communities. Our focus is on people born with intersex. So we're a little bit noisier. We encourage people to come out. We encourage people to tell their stories. We encourage people to be a little bit noisier. And noisier sometimes is looked upon as more activism oriented. The, that we're more, that we're not the conservative end of the movement, that we're, you know, the radical side of the movement. It's not the case. I mean, we're actually, bodies like ours is exceptionally conservative, um, but we're viewed upon that way by the medical community. That's okay. I think in any movement, you have to have lots of different voices. You know, bodies like ours is not afraid to make a very loud noise. They're not afraid to go out and hold signs up that say things like, big clits are sexy until you cut them off, and little penises work just fine until you cut them off. We're not afraid to do that. That's not something that I think you'll see us in doing. Do but that's okay. Do you have gorgeous pictures that I can still do? They're not very good, but I can send you a couple. Um, last question. How are you today? How am I? How are you right now in your life? You know, I'm doing really wonderful in my life. I'm doing something that I never thought I would be doing. If you had asked me five years ago that I was going to be sitting here doing intersex advocacy and intersex ad activism, if you had asked me five years ago if I was going to be doing intersex advocacy and activism, I would have laughed at you. What are you, nuts? I am doing so great. It feels so nice to be talking about it. It feels so nice to be out of the closet about it. It feels really nice not to have any secrets and shame. And I like that. And I have a career where I'm making a difference in the world. 